Vacuum tubes are an old but fascinating technology that were used before transistors were invented. We can learn how simple circuits were back then if we build a kit like this three-tube receiver. Join me on my discovery journey. I have no clue about what I'm doing, but after the video we will know more, I'm sure, whether the receiver will work or not. Gritsy YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. After the electromechanical relays, tubes were the first completely electric amplifiers. In Europe, they are also called valves, probably because they can switch electricity on and off. Lee de Forest invented them. Like many inventions, his work was based on work done by others like Edison's light bulb. He was a real inventor. Why? He owned 180 patents, but more importantly, he lost four fortunes. Obviously, he had good ideas and a lot of energy, but was not a good businessman. All tubes are entirely vacuumed, and they only work that way. I would expect that at least a little air would penetrate over the years, but no, they still work after a very long time. All valves have at least a heated filament called the cathode and a plate or anode. If we apply a voltage between the cathode and the plate, electrons emitted by the heated wire travel in the plate's direction, but not back. This is the simplest type of a vacuum tube, the rectifier tube. It has a similar function as today's diode. By the way, the anode voltages usually are relatively high, around 200 volts, and most of the tubes are heated with 6.3 volts AC or DC. If we enter a grid between the cathode and the plate and charge it negatively compared to the plate, we can control the flow of electrons with small power. This tube is called triode and amplifies the signals applied to the control grid like a today's transistor. Next, we can add a screen grid and get a tetrode. Tetrodes can be used for higher frequencies. The next complication is pentodes with a third grid. Usually, this grid is connected to the ground. If you are interested in more details, I recommend a video by Mr. Carlson's lab. You find a link below in the description. He is an authority in this field. But how can we start tinkering with tubes? I decided to buy a three-tube receiver kit. It consists of a radio and an audio amplifier. And, very important for me, voltages are not high. The maximum voltage is below 30 volts. So, I will not be killed if I make a mistake. Very good. In the last mailback video, I showed you the parts in the box. The only description I got with the kit is this shitty drawing where you hardly can read values. Not a promising start for a vacuum tube noob like me. But let's accept the challenge. I could now try to build the kit without understanding anything and just soldering all components according to the silk screen. But this is not me. I want to learn something. And I do not want to destroy it. As I always say. RTFM. I also anticipate that the kit will not work when assembled. There is plenty of room for errors. So I started the research. The valve's time definitely was before the internet time. If you find information, it is usually scanned from old drawings or books. An interesting site is radiomuseum.org, located in Switzerland. They collect information about old tubes and radios. And there I found some information about the tubes used in the kit. 2 times a 2P2 and 1 1B2. The first two are tetrodes from 1940. The second is a pentode also from 1940. Both are called miniature tubes and can be heated with a simple 1.5 volt battery. They are directly heated, as we will later see. Fortunately, I found a better readable drawing and a diagram of a similar design that shows the tube's inner circuit. 
Like that, it is easier to understand how it works. So let's walk through the diagram. The left tube is used as a regenerative receiver. Back then, this was a very innovative idea to build sensitive radios with just one tube. It acts as an oscillator at a particular frequency. On this frequency, the signal is amplified many times. This inductivity, also called RF choke, should remove all high frequency parts and should let the low frequency part pass to the next stage, which is perfect for amplitude modulated signals. The next two tubes seem to be audio amplifiers, coupled by a capacitor. On the right side, we see a transformer which transforms the high voltage down to a voltage appropriate for an 8 ohm speaker. This step is also called impedance matching. That's all. If we compare it with this modern receiver with thousands or even millions of transistors, resistors and capacitors, not a lot. The plan for the next steps is See if I have all parts and know how they look like. Populate the PCB with all the parts starting with the smallest. Before I insert the tubes, I will check the voltages to avoid casualties right at the beginning. Try out the audio amplifier. Check if we get the receiver part oscillating. Produce a signal on the appropriate frequency using a signal generator and listen if we can decode it. And finally, if everything works still now, we use my trusted Hack RF SDR transmitter to create a signal. Here I prepared a small challenge for you. However, the chance that this straightforward process will work is not big. Here you have all the parts provided with the kit. There are a few more, but these are mostly mechanical parts. Everything seems to be ok and we can start with the assembly. I use the values on the silk screen for that process. If I'm not sure, I go to the diagram and search the traces using my multimeter. A few things become clear. The resistors are too big and have to be mounted in a tombstone position. Typically, I would replace them with smaller ones of my resistor assortment. But what about this 270 picofarad variable capacitor? This strange looking part has 9 legs. A regular capacitor only needs 2 pins. How to proceed? The only reference is this DM, or is it WP, and C1 to C4. Google searches do not lead to anything. Maybe I try just variable capacitor? These days such parts are not often used anymore. And of course I use picture search. And really here it is. Its name is CBM 443DF1. Very good. Maybe this number leads to a hit. Yes, it does. We find a link to a manufacturer. And here we see the reason for the numbers C1 to C4 on the part. It contains four capacitors and it was used in these small transistor radios we all had in the 1970s. They were dual band AM and FM which of course is only the name for a layman. We know that AM was from 500 to 1600 kHz and FM was from 88 to 108 MHz. But unfortunately no pin diagram is available. Very strange. So we have to take some measurements. First I search if pins are electrically connected. And really, three of them are connected. Next I used my trusted transistor tester and started to search for measurable capacitances. I had to turn the knob in both directions and then I found a capacitance of roughly 270 picofarads between these two pins and the second one between these two pins. Perfect. Now we can continue. This switch by the way is double throw double pole or DPDT, not as shown in the diagram but much better because it switches both battery voltages. But the holes on the PCB are too small. Also a typical problem of kits. Sometimes they can no more source the original switch and replace it with a similar one without adjusting the PCB. But we are makers and the distances are correct. So I mount it in the right place, just a little bit too high. 
The next problem came when I started to test out some traces. How are pins numbered with vacuum tubes? They are numbered clockwise seen from the bottom. Now we know. Next problem. Here I have two transformers, one labeled 220 to 6 volts. Question. Which winding is the one for 220 volts? If I measure the resistance of the red wire, it shows 2.2 kilo ohms. The blue wire is only 7.6 ohms. So the red one is the 220 volt winding because it needs much more windings and maybe a thinner wire because of the smaller current. The second transformer, by the way, is only used as an inductor, not as a transformer. After answering those questions, we can finish the assembly and start to test out the different voltages. But there is the next problem. We only get a case for a 1.5 volt and a connector for a 9 volt battery. The 1.5 volts seem to be for the heating. They are probably a little too high compared to the specs, so I will discharge one battery a bit to be safe. And the 9 volts are way too low. This diagram says 22.5 volts and this one 18 to 90 volts. So I decided to add a second 9 volt battery. Now we have 19 volts with fresh batteries. Should be okay. If not, we always can add a third one. Now I can go on to step number two. Assemble the parts. Starting with the lowest ones and continuing with the bigger parts. The PCB's pre-tinning is very good and soldering is easy. I do not mount L1 and L2 because I first want to execute step 3 and 4. Check the voltages and try the audio amplifier part of my work. Like that I will discover if there is a problem in this area and fix it. The test is simple. I do not populate tubes 2 and 3 and inject a signal to this point. Of course, I use a capacitor in series to protect my signal generator. 19 volts can be deadly for a modern instrument. And really, we hear the 1 kHz sound loud and clear. It seems this stage is ok. So I populate the next tube and insert the signal here. And we hear the sound too. And the volume control also works. Now we have the most critical part in front of us. The two coils. I build them according to the instruction. One with 15 turns and one with 5 turns. Both on the same PVC tube. I used scotch tape to fix the wires. And I add two taps at 8 and 12 turns of the bigger coil. This can be used to change the frequency range in the future. They even provide a rotary switch for that. Because a regenerative receiver works with a feedback loop, it is vital to get the coil's polarization right. So I had to check the connections with the ohm meter. And then I discovered that L1 and L2 on the SIL screen are confused. Good to know before we start our final test. Such an error would be hard to find. Now we have everything together and we can go on with step number 5. Test the receiver. But I have no idea on which frequency this receiver will work, if it will work. What to do? Fortunately, I am well equipped with a spectrum analyzer, including its tracking generator. In video number 313, we saw that the tracking generator creates a ever-changing frequency. Perfect for what I want to achieve. But how can we inject the signal into the newly built radio? This is simple. Just add another coil, as we would do with an antenna in the future. By the way, you either can buy such a nano VNA or, even cheaper, a board with an AD9850 frequency generator, as used in video number 44, where I hacked my garage door opener. But first, we have to switch the radio on. Yes, it produces noise. An excellent sign for an old radio. And if we turn this potentiometer, something happens. Also good, because this potentiometer should influence sensitivity. I scan from 1 to 10 MHz. And really, we hear a recurring sound at around 7 MHz. Nice! Now we know where we have to set the frequency of the signal generator. I replace the tracking generator with a signal generator and create a amplitude modulated signal. 
If I adjust the frequency, we can hear a sound, and after a few frequency changes, we are right on the spot. Our radio works. If I change the modulation frequency, we can hear it in the loudspeaker. Cool. I even move the coil a little away from the receiver and we still hear something. Like that we can adjust the frequency precisely to the receiving frequency of our newly built radio. The modern radio, by the way, also receives the signal. But we also encounter the next problem. If I turn the variable capacitor to one end, our radio works at 4 MHz. At the other stopper it receives 13 MHz. What sounds like a great range in reality is not very useful. You can imagine how precise you have to adjust the variable capacitor to tune into a particular radio station. In addition, its capacity can be influenced by our hands. Not very practical. This is why old radios had band switches. They limited the range of the variable capacitor to a small band. Other builders of such regenerative radios use mechanically bigger variable capacitors and add a reduction dial. This is definitely needed if you want to use the radio. The coils also influence frequency stability, so it would be beneficial to glue the windings down to an exact position. Other builders used replaceable coils instead of one coil with different taps. The next thing is, of course, the antenna. If we want to listen to faraway stations, we need a long antenna. Typical antennas have a length of a quarter or a half wavelength, which is, in our case, 40 meters divided by 4 equals 10 meters minimum. And it should also hang a few meters above the ground. For my lab experiment, I just use a short wire and, as shown in the diagram, wind one end of the antenna wire around L1 and connect it to ground. If you try it outside with a longer wire, you have to do the testing after sunset, otherwise you will not hear a lot. Of course, we will not hear anything but noise in the basement. As a licensed radio operator, I am allowed to emit signals at particular frequencies, and we can proceed with the last step. I emit a small signal using my Hack RF software-defined radio. You find more information on how it works in video number 286. Because these radios were used when Morse signals were in vogue, I used such a signal to test it out. And now comes the challenge. Please write the decoded text in the comments. As promised, I show you why I know that these tubes are directly heated. If I switch the radio on, we nearly immediately hear a sound. The tubes start extremely fast. Old radios often use indirect heating and you have to wait up to 20 seconds to get a clear sound. One thing is also different from today's radios. The heating alone consumes 120 mA. So this battery will not last for a long time. You see, it was expensive to use battery operated radios back then. Of course, this project needs some refinements, as already mentioned before, and it needs at least a decent front panel. This is up to you now. I have to admit it was fun to try out this old tube technology and to see this simple radio working. The kit quality is ok, the documentation is horrible, but with this video it is maybe a little easier to be successful. Maybe you try it yourself? or with your kid or grandchild? Please post a link in the comments if you were successful. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.